All right, if you want to turn to Matthew 16, that's where we're going to start. Oh, jo okay. Let me get one of you young guys here. I forgot to give you the key. Can you go lock the back door? Thank you. All right. You know, um, our world has a lot of mysteries. You know, along the path of life, there are difficult things. There are hurdles. There are unexpected twists and turns. And there are closed doors. And there are things that seem impossible. There are problems that stop you or detour you or delay you. And the question you wind up asking is the same one that David asked in Psalm 6, where he said, My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? But often to that closed door, there is a key. Um, in Pilgrim's Progress, again, I want to encourage you to read that if you never have. Um, in, um, in Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim and Faithful wind up in Doubting Castle, and they're trapped, and they're getting beaten up, and it looks like they're going to die there. Um, but then one of them realized they had a key, and it was the key of promise. And they were able to unlock their cell and escape. The Lord has the keys. I want to look at just a few verses on that. Matthew 16, Matthew 16, verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, Others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1.18, Jesus says there, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell, and of death. Look at uh, Luke 11. Luke 11. We're going to look at this verse, and then we're going to jump back to Revelation. Luke 11, verse 52. Jesus says, Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in, ye hindered. He said, he accused them of taking away a key. Look at Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. You know, when you hit a, a locked door, you know, a locked door is always a closed door. You know what you need? You either need somebody to open it up from the inside, or you need the key. Look at Revelation 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Look at Revelation chapter 9. Revelation 9 verse 1. It says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And then you'll see that same thought again in Revelation 20, verse 1. Uh, uh, another angel has the key to the bottomless pit. So really what I'm trying to get across here is that 
is that the Lord has the keys and the Lord has the key to every locked door, every mystery, um, every crisis, every need. And some people wind up at a locked, closed door and they get discouraged after a while. And if they're not careful, they just resign themselves to being locked out or being locked in to a difficult place. And yes, we, we realize that some trials are very prolonged, but for many of those, there is a key. You guys know the story. Joseph gets sold into slavery from the time that he's sold into slavery until the time he gets out of prison. 17, um, excuse me, um, 13 years pass. Okay, he's 17 when he gets sold in. Um, he's 30 by the time he comes out of that prison. So 13 years of his life pass. He is locked away in that prison with no hint of ever getting out. But then Genesis 41 happens. Look at Genesis 41. So in Genesis 41, um, you know, Pharaoh has his two dreams. And uh, man, he's trying to find somebody that can interpret the dreams, but there's nobody that can interpret the dreams. And the chief butler says to Pharaoh, oh, wait a minute. I remember being in prison with a Hebrew guy and he could interpret dreams. Okay, so look at verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came into Pharaoh. He came hastily out of the dungeon. Um, I, I don't know how many of you folks, probably I would think very few of you have ever been in a prison. Um, you know, I know, I know a few of you have um, for various reasons. Um, <laughs> But, but I, I remember, you know, being in Prince Albert and being allowed to go into the, to the prison for about nine months. And every, uh, every Monday night, we had, held a Bible study and all that. And I remember going in there. Man, you'd walk in there and you'd come up to the, the, uh, the first reception guy and he's behind glass or she's behind glass. And they make sure of who you are and that you have clearance, you have approval to go back. And uh, man, a buzzer sounds and a real heavy metal door opens, and um, and you go through that door, and you go a ways back, and then you hit the next uh, heavy metal door, and then it opens, and you go through that. It closes behind you, and man, there's just locked doors everywhere. Just locked doors. You know, all of a sudden, Joseph gets out of prison. You know what happened that, that evening, or that morning, however that played out? Um, Somebody with keys showed up. And the man with the keys opened the locked doors and suddenly he was free. All that was needed was the key. The man with the keys. In John 8, of course, you guys could quote the verse, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. He has the keys. Have you learned to ask for the key? Like, you know, you, you, you know maybe, you're, maybe everything's great right now, but you know, how, you know how life is. You wind up sooner or later in a situation that you don't want to be in. Sometimes it's health. Sometimes it's financial. Sometimes it's a relationship thing. You know, there's a multitude of scenarios. And you know, you feel like you're locked in. Um, have, you, have you learned to ask for the key? Often, there is a key. And man, several times in the Bible, it says the Lord has the keys. So tonight, what I want to do is I want to fairly quickly, I hope, mosey through some verses that are keys. And, uh, and they'll open up a house full of blessings for you. And, um, and sometimes the key to your problem won't necessarily be a verse. Um, you know, I told this story um, months and months and months ago, probably two or three years ago. And I, I remember um, I having trouble with um, my heart rhythm. And uh, it was really getting to be a huge problem. That particular problem runs, in my, runs through some of my clan. 
and my mother had it, and then and my mother was on medication for it, you know, and that whole atrial fib thing, and um, you know they have medication for all that. But but um, I had already been on some heart medications for some other things, and I began to experience some of the side effects, and um, you know I just decided that I didn't want to live with those side effects, and um, so I remember, especially with the atrial fib thing, I went to the Lord. You know, it says that, um, which king was it? Uh, the Lord, um, I believe it was Joash. Later in life, though he had been a great king early on, it says he sought to the physicians instead of the Lord. And the Holy Ghost puts that in the eternal record. Is it wrong to go to the doctor? No, you got Luke, the beloved physician, and and uh, man, there's God has a great benefit for us through those guys, but He wants to be sought first. Why? Because He has the key. Hezekiah, you're going to die, and He rolls over on his bed and He pleads with the Lord and He weeps, and God says, Isaiah, go tell him I'm going to let him live. And here's the key. Throw some figs on that, on that boil. That was the key. Uh, with my atrial fib, I, uh, I uh, started doing some research. And I got on my knees and I said, oh, Lord God. I said, I don't want to live like this. I said, if there is a key, please put it in my hand. And I am here to tell you that in just a very few days, I found some, I started trying something, trying this, trying that. You know, I was looking up it, and I absolutely found the key. I found it. I've been using it for the last 10 years. And it's wonderful. And I don't have to go to the pharmacy. Uh, have you learned to ask for the key? Okay, here we go. Psalm 106. I want to give you some verses that are keys. And, um, and you know what? You're going to walk away tonight and you're going to say, yeah, and you're, you're going to think of 20 more yourself. And that's okay. I just want to give you a few. Psalm 106, verse 3. Blessed are they that keep judgment and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Now, it's sort of coincidence, okay? Um, but every one of these verses is an all, okay? And I didn't really intend for it to be that way, but that's where it went. So here we go. Psalm 106.3. You know, one of the keys, uh, a real key, there are some keys spiritually that will open up a house full of blessing that will really help you be on track, stay on track, uh, never, never wind up in that place where you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're desperately far from God and you're trying to find your way back. And thank God he welcomes people back and there's people that find their way back. But, you know, they wouldn't have been in that position if there's just some simple things that they had done. Um, Blessed are they that keep judgment and he that doeth righteousness at all times. Boy, one of the keys to staying right with God and, and getting blessings dumped on your head and just knowing everything's okay is doing righteousness at all times. You know, you know a, a lot of Christians do. They, they do righteous. They're, they do it, but it's just not all the time. You know, blessed are they, righteous at all times. You know, like in the morning, you know, that'd be a good time. Um, before you've had your coffee, after a terrible restless night, in the morning traffic, at work, doing righteousness, in the evening, in the middle of the night, in good times, on vacation. It's amazing. You know, sometimes people leave God. They leave their righteousness back in their hometown. No, no, no. Blessed is he that doeth righteousness at all times. You know, at the mall, when you're out of town, when you're with the relatives, when you're lonely, 
in season, out of season, when you're being pressured, when you're being delayed, when you get bad news, when somebody flatters you, when you have a bunch of free time, you know there's never a bad time to do the right thing. Blessed are they that do righteousness at all times. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. Psalm 62, trust in him at all times. Um, he that doeth righteousness at all times. I want you to look at another one, 1 Thessalonians 5. We're just going to lightly touch on these, 1 Thessalonians 5. Blessed are they that do right. That's a key. You know, you'd, you'd almost never wind up in a mess if we did righteousness at all times. You know, your conscience would seldom ever get ruffled if we did righteousness at all times. You know, you'd, you'd wind up down the road somewhere with almost probably hardly ever a regret if we just did righteousness at all times. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Prove Prove all things. This is another key. There was a preacher of uh, the late 1900s, and, and uh, he's long since with the Lord, and he made a statement. He said, people are sure of a lot of things that aren't so. In other words, people believe a lot of things are true that are not true. And I mean, they'll just about fight you over it. Um, you know what, and, and they, they look at you weird that you would even question it. But you know what, um, the Lord doesn't want you to doubt everything or necessarily be suspicious. But you know, the Lord does say, prove all things. Prove all things. Um, you know, um, how do you do that? How do you prove all things? Okay, ready? There's a few things. Um, you, you do a little searching. You do a little searching. Um, you... you um, when I say search, and, and sometimes, honest to goodness, it just takes a very tiny bit of searching. I got a hold of the book, um, 50 Years in the Church of Rome by Charles Chinnicky. Charles Chinnicky is a, uh, um, he lived in the 1800s, and he's a, he became a converted Roman Catholic priest. His story is absolutely captivating. And uh, the edited version, which is put out by Chick Publications, the edited version is 300 pages. And um, I remember wading into that thing, and, uh, and I actually just read it within the last six months. And I picked up that book, and I absolutely could not hardly put it down. And then I thought, well, that's just me. You know, I was just, it just really grabbed me. And then somebody else in my family got a hold of it, and uh, I didn't say a word. And they came to me, and some of the first words out of their mouth was, I couldn't hardly put it down. That book is an amazing book. And it's 300 pages, and it talks about his whole career as a Roman Catholic priest and, and all that God did to finally bring him to the place where he got converted. And then, um, and then when he got converted, his whole church got converted. It's a wild story. He gets up there. You know, he gets saved. And, and I mean, he is as saved as you and me. And he realizes finally, oh, my soul, I have just embraced the Christianity of the Protestants, you know. And he's like, but, but he is thrilled to be saved. And he gets up in front of his church, a big church. His people loved him, even as a lost Roman Catholic priest, because he was so honorable. And he loved his people, even as a lost priest, and they loved him. He gets up and he lays out the whole thing of, how he had just become a Christian. And he said, how many of you this morning would like to join me in turning to Jesus Christ alone? Would you please stand? The whole church did. I mean, there were hundreds. Of, and he thought, no, they, they misunderstood. They misunderstood. So he has them all sit back down. He tells it again. And his whole church, that's pretty good for a Sunday morning service. I mean, there were hundreds of people there. So all that said, when I, when I read the book, all, you know, 350 pages or whatever, I, I, it, it dawned on me, it said edited, which means 
The original version is out there somewhere. And, um, but to shorten it, you know, whatever, they've taken chapters and pieces out of it. Uh, whoever the author was, he didn't change the wording. The wording is still Charles Chinnikey's, but he took sections out. So I thought, where am I going to find the original copy? So here's my point. I had to search. So I thought, where am I going to find that thing? So I started searching online used book sites, and I tried to find the original copy. I couldn't find it. You know, it's amazing. Some of these books that are like um, hand grenades to certain cult groups are very hard to find. They have, they have done their diligence to eliminate those books. And uh, I thought, where am I going to find it? Well, I had found another book that like that a year or two back, and I found it by looking for a PDF copy, and a, a PDF copy popped up in a um, university archive. So I thought, maybe there's a PDF copy. So I type in, complete and unabridged, 50 years in the Church of Rome, Charles Kinnicky, and boom, there it was. A PDF Complete and unabridged, 600 pages in a university archive. Took me 15 minutes to find it. And a bunch of paper. <laughs> Here's my point. I had to search. But it only took me a few minutes. Boy, if God's people would just search just a little. Just a little. Search, prove all things. How do you do it? You search. You know, Jesus said, Jesus said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify me. Jesus said, you want to know me? Search, search. You'll find me here. Search. And then, I, you know, I, I know this is a, a no brainer, but think, think. Um, there's some things that just really become obvious with a tiny bit of thought, okay? Here's another one. Be fearless. Be fearless. How do you prove all things? Well, you, you have to come to the place you're not afraid of what you're going to find, and you're not afraid of who's going to be upset either way. You know, the fear of man bringeth a snare. And boy, there are some people that they are just afraid. They're afraid to search because they just have a sneaking feeling what they're going to find. And it's going to put them at odds with some of their friends or somebody that they fear. So be fearless. Um, consider, consider. Okay, you know, this, this is the day of, um, this is the day of um, winds of doctrine. You know, Ephesians 4, be not carried about with every wind of doctrine. And I don't think there's ever been a day like today where it's just the wind is just blowing left, right, and center, and people are being blown all over the place. Um, consider, consider, you, you're, you know, you hear something and you're going, wow, you know, this is different. You know, this, I, I wasn't taught this and all that. Well, maybe it's right. Maybe it's not. But have you ever considered where it's leaning? You ever considered where it's leaning? Um, okay, so I'm just going to say this. Um, you know, the whole, the whole anti-Israel thing and the whole replacement theology thing. Um, you know, there's, there's always been churches that, that believe that, okay? The, re, the Reformed churches, they've always uh, believed in replacement theology, okay? But, but it's, it's a strange thing. It's, um, some of the Reformed churches are actually very pro-Israel in, in Holland. It really is an amazing thing. And I, I don't quite have all those pieces put together. But, but they, some of those Reformed churches are very pro-Israel for whatever the reason. Um, but what's interesting is, is in the day that we live, and especially since October 7th, it has absolutely skyrocketed. Um, you guys know as well as I do, there are even evangelicals. It's coming in like a flood. And... Um, when they embrace replacement theology, you know where that puts you? That puts you about two steps away from supporting Hamas. You say, preacher, that's extreme. No, can, please, please forgive me, but you don't know what you're talking about. In this room, 
somebody was visiting some lost people that have attended our church on a, several occasions just, just in the last few weeks. While they were visiting, and they're, they're sweet people, while they were there, another person was there from an alliance church in this city, an alliance church. This guy is a policeman. And he goes to the Alliance Church. Now, he says he's saved, although he uses the F word quite frequently in the conversation. And, uh, uh, and so he's, he's talking. And you know what he brought up? Anti-Israel. Man, Israel is the, this whole thing. This is the cause of all the grief in the world and all that nonsense. It, it, which way is it leaning? You know, you're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hear something new. Oh man, Acts chapter 17. All they did was to hear or see something new. And so you're gonna hear something new. So here's the question. I, I my question is, can you please tell me which way that wind is blowing? Where if I jump on that boat and I go with the wind, where is it gonna take me? That'll tell you a whole lot about some things. When you're trying to prove it. Your prove means find out exactly what it's made of. Where is it going? What spirit does it create? What spirit does it create? Um, many of you remember um, Kent Hovind. And uh, man, back in the day, we, we loved Kent Hovind. Um, I think about 2006, he came to Melfort, Saskatchewan. And uh, we went to hear him, and there were churches all over that would come to hear him, and he would do his two-day seminar thing. And we loved his debates. I still have them. I still have some of his debates from back in that era uh, before, you know, he got all wrapped up in that, that anti-tax nonsense that got him thrown in prison. And so he gets thrown in prison. Well, while he's in prison, he totally changes several of his doctrinal positions. Okay, that's neither here nor there. But here's my, here's my point. You know, a lot of people have since embraced some of his doctrinal positions that he came out with. But here's the comment that was made, okay? And somebody said, I, I haven't looked. I, I, I haven't followed him since his prison days. I really haven't. Except to see a few articles that people have forwarded me, you know, some of his stuff and where he's went since then. And here's what somebody said. They said, man, he sure has a negative, hateful spirit compared to what he had before. Hello? What spirit did his new doctrine create? Did it make him more Christ-like? That is a huge red flag. We're talking about proving all things. The spirit of Christ. Paul said, I was gentle among you. Prove all things. Prove all things. Um, here's what happens. You've got all these, these revisionists. I brought books and articles with me tonight. I got several. And we're going to run out of time unless I go to 10 o'clock. And... Um, so I, I've got lots of stuff. And, um, you know, in the last 30 years, one of the real movements has been the revisionist movement. And what they've done is, is they've begun to revise all sorts of historical things. And, um, and so here's what that does. It puts you and I in a sort of awkward position, and it, 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 it sort of knocks you off balance. Because here's people that 30 years ago, we all believed the same thing, and we all trusted a, a lot of the historical things that we were taught. And now, and, and we're, not, we're not talking about, we're talking about major things. And now they're telling us that this was wrong and this isn't true and, and this and that and the other. And, and, um, and they just, they're changing history. Well, you know what you got to do? You got to take, you got to prove all things. And can I tell you, it's really not hard. It just takes, it just takes a tiny bit of time and a tiny bit of looking for the right information. And um, let me give you a couple examples. Um, how many of you, many of you have heard of the book, no doubt, but how many of you have the book called The Persecutor by Sergei Kordikov? Okay, one, two, three. We get three. Um, you ought to read it. It's pretty graphic, and it's pretty rough, but you ought to read it. 
Um, Sergei Kordikov was a Russian KGB guy, and his specialty was raiding Christian meetings and beating people half to death and to death. And uh, that's what he did. He was a young KGB soldier. He, he took in squads. They would raid the churches. Oh, his story of salvation is an amazing story. There was this young, beautiful blonde that he'd beaten on more than one occasion because he'd caught her at more than one home. And he said, one day, there she was again. And these guys are brutal. You know what it reminds me of? What Saul of Tarsus must have been like. Boy, how God can change somebody. The name of Sergei Kordikov's book is called The Persecutor. And what brought his salvation about was he had his billy club, and there's that girl. And I can't remember if she was, you know, she saw him coming. I mean, here all of a sudden the police are in the building. They're grabbing people and beating them up. And there she is. And I don't know if she was still singing or praying. And he takes his club and he leans back. And he, he said, I was going to kill her. And he said, I leaned back with all my might. A young Russian soldier. You talk strong as a bull. He said, I was going to hit her for with all I had. And he said, something grabbed my hand. And he said, I looked. He said, there was nothing there. He said, it grabbed my hand. It was a hand grabbed my hand. And he said, instantly, I knew what had just happened. And he says, that was the beginning of me coming to Jesus Christ. He tells his story in the book and and uh, he gets to the end of the book. The book was written, I don't know, I, I can't remember exactly if it was copyrighted, late 60s, or early 70s. And he says at the end of the book, he said, someday you may hear that I died in an accident. He said, but don't you believe it? He said, it will not have been an accident. In the next two years, uh, what happened with Ser Sergei Kordikov was he was on a Russian naval ship and um, uh, they were off the coast of Canada one stormy night. He had been preparing for this for months and months, he had been working out like a madman because he was going to fall overboard during a storm and try to swim to the shore. He said it was a stormy, cold night. If you know anything about ocean water and cold water, man, it was, it, you know, he was, it was because, you know, he was like these ultra special ops guys and, and he, he fought the water for hours, and that's how he stayed warm. And, and um, he swam in the darkness and swam and swam and swam. He couldn't see, where, but he, he just sort of had an idea where he was going. And it's a long story. But somewhere in the morning hours, he spotted shore. And uh, he suffered from that swim. His heart rhythm was massively off for a long time after that. But he said, I saw the shore and I started swimming. But he said, you got you to understand, I was exhausted beyond exhaustion. And he said, somewhere about a mile from shore, he said, that's the last thing I remember. And he said, I woke up on the shore. And he defected to Canada. And he said, it wasn't long. He said, I started going around telling my story. And he said, all of a sudden, two big bruisers would walk up to me on the street and they would say, Sergey, you better shut up or we're going to kill you. And they were Russian agents. And he said that happened on several occasions. And it was almost two years later, he was skiing and a pistol he was carrying accidentally went off. You say, why do you tell us that? I've got other stories uh, if we had time tonight that I could relay, I've talked about the story of Camp 14. Uh, the young guy, I've got his picture in his article here uh, that survived Camp 14. The only, the only young man to ever escape that camp. Uh, it was a camp of 250,000 people in North Korea. There's many of those camps in North Korea. And um, he escaped. Long story short, he, um, he winds up getting to North America and... Um, but as time passed, you start reading articles and, and he printed, they printed a book about his story. And now they're saying, well, he exaggerated this and this really wasn't true and this really wasn't true and this really wasn't true. And
Yeah, like this isn't true. Treblinka. There were hundreds of death camps. Hundreds. But there were six or seven major ones. One of them was Treblinka, the Holocaust. 600,000 people died in this camp. 600 escaped one night, and that's what this book is about. A bold and daring escape. Unbelievable. They burned that thing down. They, they had hidden some guns and some grenades, and, and man, one day they, they had it planned, and, um, and they managed to set that place on fire they, a few of them got killed trying to get out, but they killed a bunch of the Russian soldiers on their, on the, the German soldiers on their way out. It's, it's, oh, it's captivating. But out of that 600, only 40 ultimately survived. And he makes a comment in this book. There's, there's a lot of amazing comments here. I said 600,000, 800,000. Listen to this. 40, okay, 40 out of the 800,000 who died there, 40 out of the 600 who revolted. The number is pitiful. Yet without this tiny remnant, the facts about Treblinka would never be known. The whole thing would never have happened where there is no story. There is no reality. And the revisionist says, oh, it didn't happen. There's book after book after book, people stories, people stories. I, I, we come across them all the time. Well, you know, Pastor, you know, that, that stuff really was exaggerating. It really didn't happen. I love you, but you're out of your mind. All you got to do is just do a little search. You say, Pastor, you're just holding that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to play technical on me. I got a gob of these. Different stories, different people. Prove all things. Don't believe the numbskull on the internet who's got his agenda. Prove it. Prove it. It's uh, pretty easy. And if they'll lie about this, I wouldn't trust anything they say. And I got a whole bunch more stuff down here. But 10 o'clock is getting closer. <laughs> Martin Luther King. I say his name. And you know what you've been taught? A bunch of you have been taught he was a great guy. It is just, it just boggles my mind. It boggles my mind. There's this Christian book series, you know, and, and, you know, as homeschoolers, you know, a lot of you guys, you get these books, you know, and, and it's got heroes, you know, of Christianity, you know, and so you've got, you know, John Wesley, true hero, George, George Whitfield, true hero, you know, um, Hudson Taylor, true hero. And then all of a sudden in the mix, you've got Martin Luther King. And you know what? They'll tell you the story. He's a great guy. Here's the problem with all that. None of you grew up in that time period. Some of you don't even know what that name is. On your calendar, there's Martin Luther King Day. They said he was a great civil rights activist and all that stuff. I remember those days. I was just a kid. I remember that era. Here's why I'm saying this. I was sitting at a, in a preacher's meeting, and here's these two preachers that I love and respect that are older than me, and they're talking about this guy like he's a hero, and I'm just sitting there going, What? Because I remember the old guard. And the old guard had no use for him whatsoever. None. Imagine it. Imagine it. I die tomorrow. Let's hope that doesn't happen. I die tomorrow. And Bob comes to church next Sunday and says, isn't it wonderful? And you go, what's wonderful? I say, the Canadian Secret Service, they had a file on Pastor Newman. They just sealed it up for 50 years. Isn't that wonderful? You'd be going, what? The criminal record, the criminal activities, the evil activities, on his death, they sealed it for 50 years. They don't do that with a good guy. 
They just opened it up a little while back. And I did some reading in those files. But here's my point. Nobody from that era thought anything good about him. I asked my mother, you know, in her last couple of years of life, I said, mother, here's my point. I was trying to prove, I was trying to get to the bottom of this. And I said, I said to my mother, I said, mother, what do you remember about Martin Luther King? And my mom stopped and she looked at the floor for a minute and she looked up and she said, he was a troublemaker. She said, everywhere he went, there were riots. Can you imagine? I just got back to Montreal and said, Pastor, how'd it go? Say, oh, it was wonderful. I came to town and they started burning down buildings everywhere. People were in the street. They were tearing down the shops and busting out the windows. It was just great. You'd be going, oh, praise the Lord, I think. <laughs> is, 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 is that the mark of a great man? But you've been told it is. Prove all things. You need to prove your own heart. Because your heart will lie to you. I'm going to stop there tonight. So I've given you two keys tonight. One is, blessed is he that doeth righteousness at all times. If you only live with that key in your pocket for the rest of your life, you would do wonderful. Because it would take you through all the times you don't understand and all the hurts and all the misunderstandings. You'd still do the right thing at all times. And you know what you'd find? You'd find the blessings keep falling. And the other is prove all things. Prove all things. The Lord has the keys. There's difficult things that you're going to come up against, things you don't know how to deal with, things that don't make sense, difficult, pressured situations in your life, sad situations. And there's going to be some things you're just going to, you're just going to find yourself in this place where you're going to go, Lord, I have no idea why I'm here, and I don't know what to do. And that's when you need to look to heaven. Remember what I said at the beginning? Have you learned to ask for the key? Because he has the keys. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this simple truth. Lord, bless it to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, it's really not a get right with God kind of a thing. But, uh, but maybe, maybe you needed a minute or two. Maybe you got something and you need to look up towards heaven right now and say, Lord, I've been trapped in this spot for a long time. Lord, I sure would like it if you gave me the key. Lord, thank you that you have the keys. Lord, bless this truth. Help us, Lord, that we would do righteousness at all times. And Lord, help us to prove all things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.